Okay, I guess we'll begin uh, this talk on uh, free trade and its enemies. I mentioned in my first talk on Monday that um, there are certain issues, especially where neoclassical economists and Austrians are uh, uh, in sympathy with each other. They hold very uh, similar views. The mainstream also uh, you know, understands the principle of comparative advantage and <laughs> use this and talk about the division of labor and so on. And in this sense, the, uh, the Austrian view uh, goes beyond right, what the neoclassical uh, economists do. Uh, with their models and so on, and you know we have a more robust uh, uh, analysis than they do. But we're not really uh, saying uh, things that would uh, you know shock them, or you know they, they would say, oh, there can't be a division of labor. Uh, you know that's just comparative cost is crazy or whatever. And, and it's the same with free trade. Uh, you, you'll find, in fact, a, a seeming a paradox that uh, neoclassical economists tend to be in favor of free trade. Free trade is understood now uh, as uh, trade between nations, right? Free, free trade, free movement of goods and people and capital between nations. <clears throat> Much more than they are domestic free markets. You know, so even guys like Paul Samuelson tend to be sort of, in, in, you know, sort of loosely speaking, of free trade. It's sort of strange, right? I mean, why, why would this, you would think if they held this view, they could see the logic uh, the, or the ill logic of, of uh, saying that, you know, we ought to have all these domestic, each state should intervene and control domestic trade, but, but between states we ought to have, an, you know, almost entirely free trade, right? because the classic, it's a classic reductio ad absurdum for economists to point out that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, free traders don't uh, argue that Pennsylvania should, should erect trade barriers against California, right? Everybody can see, or at least those who accept free trade can see that that would be a bad thing, right? That, and therefore, we shouldn't have the state intervening domestically to uh, create barriers of trade be between the, the natives of that country, right? That, so, so it seems to just kind of follow out. It seems like this is a gigantic uh, uh, conflict, right? Almost contradiction to hold Domestic intervention is a good thing, while simultaneously free trade is also a good thing. Anyway, uh, we want to uh, what we want to do in this talk is just very briefly outline the case for free trade. You know exactly what additional theoretical work we have to do to get to this uh, argument for free trade, and then we want to spend the bulk of the time talking about the uh, objections to it, the the arguments for protectionism and against free trade. <clears throat> uh, okay, so let's. Uh, Let's start for the uh, just a quick review of the case for the market economy. And remember, up to this point, we've made this case only for a single territory. All right, so I, I don't think any of the talks uh, up to this point have at least uh, focused on what if we have different, <laughs> you know, political territories in the world. We so we've just said, hey, we have an economy, we have a market economy, and there's private property and uh, you know contract and. Uh, there's uh, 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 money, sound money, market provided money, and then uh, through this there would be economic calculation, and the, the advantage of this is that uh, we're all able to uh, more efficiently arrange uh, the division of labor because entrepreneurs can uh, use economic calculation to determine the efficient arrangement of things, and then we can all self-select according to monetary incentives into the different occupations and the different things we buy and, uh, 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 and, and the different lines of investment and so on and so forth, right? And the same argument about capital accumulation. So here the market gives full outlet to our time preference uh, desires to save and invest. And then the entrepreneurs can direct that investment, the capitalists and the entrepreneurs direct that investment to valuable lines of uh, the buildup of the capital structure. And so we get economic progress and uh, higher standards of living over time. And, and again, uh, it, it's not that uh, faster growing standards of living are better than slower growing standards of living. It's that the market gives us what we prefer. So if we, we have a society with high time preferences, uh, well, we, uh, you know, we want present gratification, then that's what the market will give us relative to the future. And then, right, so the, so the market operates uh, in this fashion. Um, 
And any imposition then of state, uh, uh, of the state, of, of coercive power of the state, would simply interfere with this process and slow it down, you know, muck it up, uh, make it less effective. Right. So that so that's the basic argument, right? The basic ground that we've covered up to this point. <laughs> Uh, now, what we add when we uh, move to the to the uh, issue of uh, of uh, free trade is this question of different uh, political territories. What if we have not not one you know single uh, political economy, if you will, but uh, a, a multiplicity of political units in the world? Then that opens up another question, right? It doesn't. It isn't, uh, one has to do a little bit more theoretical work to see what should be the policy of any one polity within a world of different polities, <laughs> right? That would be an interesting question right, to, to think about. Okay, well, again, we're not going to go through an elaborate discussion of this. I, I, I'm just kind of relying on your general knowledge of this area. It's not, again, uh, to rocket science to make the application here. We want to spend most of our time with uh, arguments uh, in favor of protectionism. But anyway, the basic argument about different polities is <clears throat> that the economy, the economy is that uh, people interacting in the division of labor economy uh, knows no geographic territory. Right? We, have a, we have a world economy, regardless of political territories. The economy w would extend uh, throughout the world. And therefore, it follows from that, that if we can extend the economy throughout the world, one, one system of economic calculation and entrepreneurial you know, uh, decision-making in, in production and uh, the self-selection process, right? If it could be extended to the whole world, then we'd get the benefits that we've been talking about, right, across the whole world for for uh, uh, that we've been talking about just as you, you know, implicitly as one single political territory. So the best policy for all, all political territories is to adopt free and open trade, right? Uh, so, so that doesn't seem like too much of a stretch of our theory to, to cover that case. Because all we have to do is recognize that the econ regardless of political interference, there's just one world economy, right? We're all integrated into the same economy, or will be, you, you know, unless the uh, state coercion... Uh, prevents us altogether. We would just do this. So we would, we would integrate the Chinese into our production and the division of labor and our consumption and the Malaysians and the, right, and the Germans and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> uh, okay, so, so, that, so that again is not, uh, hopefully that just seems straightforward application of our previous case. And that, but now we get to the case at hand, right? The case of uh, 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 that we need to pursue, which is, what if we have a world, though, that's configured in different polities, where not every government of every other political territory accepts free trade? Th then what do we do? Then what's the best policy, right? What, what if, what if the, uh, what if the Chinese put uh, 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 barriers to trade between Americans and Chinese, or, or you know, vice versa? What if the Americans put up barriers to the Chinese to trade with other Americans. What if, what if that happens? What then would be the best policy for, for a given state, given that other states are interfering with free trade, you know, among, among the citizens uh, of their territory and the citizens of this country? <clears throat> okay, well, again, uh, we're not going to spend much time with this. Hopefully, again, you can see that this is a fairly straightforward application of our previous discussion. The best policy for any, economically speaking, the best policy for any uh, a state over one territory in a world of states that are interfering with free trade is to have free trade, right? <laughs> and again, the, the argument is very straightforward. It's just that, uh, okay, so if, uh, if uh, the uh, Chinese government is interfering with, uh, let's say, American sales of uh, automobiles in China by having tariffs on you know, uh, cars that are uh, imported from the U.S. And this, this lowers our standard of living to some degree, right? As we talked about before, anytime the state interferes, it reduces the extension of the division of labor and makes us physically less productive, less efficient, and therefore our standards of living are lower. It doesn't help citizens of the country being affected by this if its state then does the same thing, lowering standards of living again for 
uh, you know, erects its own trade barriers, let's say, against the Chinese. And then, uh, you know, in another area like agriculture, we get this uh, disillusion of the division of labor even further. So if, you know, one, one person comes along and cuts off your right hand, uh, it's not a good policy to cut off your left in response, right? I mean, that, okay, so this is the, this is the basic argument. And again, there are nuances to this that we won't go into. It just seems like a pretty straightforward application of, of the uh, basic argument for the market economy uh, that we've developed throughout the week. <clears throat> um, and by the way, let me just uh, re reiterate that if a person can't accept this, if they have some sort of nativist bias or, you know, they're nationalist uh, prejudice or whatever it is, uh, it, it's always helpful to use this reductio ad absurdum on them. Well, okay, so if you think it's a really good idea for the state to erect barriers to trade between the, the you know, the evil Chinese, because they're, they're evil and they're taking over or whatever, then why don't we erect uh, barriers? Why isn't it good to erect barriers, good for us, Americans, to erect barriers between ourselves, right? The, the, why, why, don't, why doesn't Pennsylvania secede from the Union and erect barriers with everyone? Or if, if Washington erected barriers between trade of people in Pennsylvania and California, we wouldn't think it a good idea for the Pennsylvanians then to erect more barriers to trade with people in Ohio, right? That, that just doesn't... So hopefully the logic of the, of the case be, becomes exposed when you do this uh, kind of thought experiment. <clears throat> okay. So now let's move to uh, arguments for uh, protection. And here, let's just, for clarity, let's just uh, list out the categories of what, we, what we'll call protectionist policies. <clears throat> so uh, protectionist policy, the state in one political territory, like uh, so the federal government in the U.S., would um, uh, coercively interfere with market activity between its citizens and citizens of other political territories, right? And, and typically, this literature is divided into uh, barriers of the movement of goods and uh, services. So they're, uh, you know, like tariffs and quotas and so on and so forth. So, so the American government erects uh, sanctions uh, for trade with uh, Iranians. Right? It's illegal now for Americans to sell to Iranians or uh you know, and they would be thrown in jail for doing this sort of thing. And so, so that's one kind of a, a, a protectionist policy. And then the other would be capital controls, right? Uh, the governments can, and this is just a kind of arbitrary distinction, right? We, uh, it's useful just for uh, the purpose of doing analytical work, but it's not uh, like a logically necessary distinction between the two. But there, but then there are capital controls. So the Greek government right now won't permit people to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, move funding out of the country. In fact, they won't even let them take their funding out of banks, right? So there could be, there could be that kind of a, uh, that could be a protectionist element. There could be a protectionist uh, impulse behind that sort of a thing. So they're, they're trade barriers and they're uh, capital controls. These are the, that, that's how the literature divides the different types of protectionist uh, policies. Okay, so with all that as background, let's uh, jump into uh, some of these. Let's start with the mercantilism. <clears throat> Most of you know that the mercantilists were the first, uh, well, at least the Western European uh, sort of systematic uh, protectionist the, the, uh, uh, policies. And this began with the, uh, with the Spanish uh, in the 16th century. And you remember the history here, the Spanish uh, uh, conquered... Uh, uh, Mexico, what's now Mexico, right? And they uh, enslaved the natives and uh, uh, put them to work in the uh, gold and silver mines, extracted the gold and silver, minted it into coins, and then shipped the coins back to Spain. And this led to a huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, largesse for the Spanish government. Right? They were running this production uh, system, right? So the the the, the uh, money would come into Spain, and they they bought. Uh, you know, they funded the big armada and all this, uh, and all these lavish uh, uh, expenditures uh, for the crown and, and what have you. And all the other, all the other uh, uh, governments of uh, Europe, who, who, and they were moving, remember, into this period of what we call royal absolutism, right? 
the strong central governments, uh, wanted to mimic this. Well, they, you know, it was very hard to mimic it uh, in the same way that the Spanish had done by conquering some territory where there was gold mines, you know, and then enslaving people and uh, producing gold. Uh, you know, they tried some of that, but it didn't really pan out very well. So, so they thought, well, you know, maybe there are other ways in which we can arrange our uh, interaction, you know, the interaction uh, internationally, the economic activity internationally, so that money flows into our country. And then we would get the benefits, just like the Spanish, right? We would get these benefits. That, that, that's how they were thinking about this, right? And so, so that's what they began to do. They, they, they would subsidize exports, and they would tax imports and try to uh, create an uh, imbalance in trade, an artificial imbalance in trade. So that, that was really uh, maybe the first prominent in Western civilization, at least the first prominent use of protectionist measures as we've uh, defined them. Okay, well, um, the, the uh, classical economists were up to the task of uh, criticizing this. In fact, he, he, just the work of David Hume was sufficient to smash all of this, right? And Hume pointed out uh, the following, uh, had the following arguments against this. Uh, first was his famous uh, price specie flow mechanism where he pointed out, wait a minute, think about this. <laughs> this is great, this is a great, uh, economic mind at work, right? He's thinking like an economist. He's saying, okay, you do this, and then that causes this effect, and then that effect causes this next effect, and there's a whole chain of events put into motion by, what, by this policy. So you create this policy that artificially stimulates the inflow of money. And remember, uh, David Hume is writing in a period where there was a uh, universal money worldwide money. So gold and silver were the worldwide monies, right? So, the, so we didn't have distinct monetary regimes in different countries like we do today, different fiat monies. And so, okay, so all this money, all this money flows out of one country and into your country. And then the, then the question is, what happens next? Well, what happens next is prices are bid up in your country, right? And prices are bid down in the country where the money is flowing out. But that means that uh, your exports become uh, more expensive and imports cheaper. And so the, the, the policy is reversed. It's self-reversing. And so it, it's just, it, so it only works temporarily to do this. And then, and then uh, people will, will re-equilibrate. <laughs> right? And so the price species flow mechanism, a, a brilliant uh, response right, uh, to this, to this uh, policy. He also, uh, as an adjunct to this, he pointed out that uh, no social benefit accrues by having more money. The, the, any amount of money can perform all of the exchanges that people want to perform in society. So there's no social benefit. It doesn't enhance the medium of exchange function of money to have more of it. It just means that prices will be higher. And if we have less of it, prices will be lower. But we can make all the exchanges that we want to make regardless. And so you see what he's doing, right? He's saying, therefore, since there's no social benefit here, there's only benefit to certain groups at the expense of other groups, right? What, what the money inflow does, what money inflation does is create uh, wealth transfers. And so you, then you can ask the question, who gets this money first? And, and you know, who's benefiting? The state and it's, you, you know, who, who benefited in Spain when the money came in? And the answer is the Spanish crown and then the producers who catered to their uh, demands for things, the shipbuilders who built the armada, and the you know, tapestry weavers who made the tapestries in their castles, and so on. They, they all benefited. But, but then the other people uh, were harmed, right? We're just shifting wealth. Since, since having more money doesn't create wealth, it just, it just makes the price structure move up and down. Well, up if we have more money, and down if we have less. So again, uh, an excellent uh, response. And then finally, uh, the classical economists also pointed out that the balance of payments accounts upon which this policy depends, you know, creating a, a net inflow, the merchandise trade surplus in the balance of payments accounts, they pointed out that really these balance of payments accounts are not um, fundamental to economic activity. They're, they're, they're really uh, just sort of ancillary to that. So let's take a minute to uh, look at this. Uh, the balance of payments come, uh, calculations come about uh, in the following fashion. 
so we could do this for any person or any group of people. We could calculate the balance of payments. So it would go in the following way. A person has uh, goods and services to sell to other people. And so he exports these things to other people. And then, and then he gets paid. He gets paid in money. Then he takes the money and he does one of these four things, right? He can buy goods and services from other people. He would be importing the goods from them then. Or he could buy real assets from other people. Or he could buy financial assets from other people, right? Claims to the value of the assets. Or he could just hold the money. So these are the options that any person has or group of people have when they, when they participate in the market. They sell things in the market, then they get funding, and then they buy things from other people and so on. And if we want to keep track of uh, the summary of this, it's quite obvious that these four options exhaust the logical possibilities, right? So that's why this is called a balance of payments. So if we add up the four, the sums of the four, I'll give you a numeric example in a minute, but if we add up the, the sum of what the person does with the income that they earn from selling things, into these four categories, it must add up to their income. <laughs> right? That's why it's called a balance of payments. So it always balances, right? That, that's a critical feature of this. <clears throat> okay, so uh, here's what we would then say as we think about the logic of this, the meaning of the balance of payments accounts. First of all, is to point out the balance of payments accounts are not a form of economic calculation. They're not an aid to decision-making about what to do. Uh, let me just give you again a, a reductio ad absurdum example. I run a huge balance of payment uh, a deficit with Amazon. Right? I import everything from them, all the goods that come to me, and I just pay with money. I export no goods or services to them whatsoever. I just pay in money. There's a huge balance of payments surplus. Now, that that doesn't the fact that I run this balance of payments uh, surplus with them doesn't enter into my decision to buy from them at all. <laughs> Right? I never think, oh, you know, I, I better not buy from Amazon today because that I'll have a balance of payments. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll increase my balance of payments surplus. I, I, you know, this might injure my my you know situation somehow. Now, of course, I might say, look, I don't have enough money to buy. <laughs> you know, that but that's different, right? That's a different. I don't need balance of payments to know that. I can I can see that just on my checking account ledger, or, you know, my bank balance. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so that's right. So we can see this. Uh, you know, to give you the, to extend the example, I run a huge balance of payments surplus with Grove City College, where I work. I, I export my services to them. I don't import any goods from them at all, hardly any. Right? I buy a sweater at the bookstore or something, but and, and they and they just pay me money. So and I don't say, oh, hurrah. You know, is it, this is wonderful. I'm going to keep doing this because it's a balance of, because money is flowing in. You know, it's a balance of payments. No, I do it because I just have a preference for this, right? I, I don't need to know about my balance of payments to make a decision as to whether or not to sell my labor services to Grove City College. I don't need the balance of payments. The balance of payments is just a ledger account. I, I'm not saying the balance of payments is meaningless. I'm just saying I don't need to know it for making economic decisions. I, I can keep track of my the decisions that I've made in the past, I keep track of with the balance of payments. You see, that's a, it's a different thing, right? I don't need to, you know, with, with economic calculation, what we're doing is, uh, Joe Salerno uh, explained, is appraisement. Right? We're using the accounts to make anticipations of the future so we can act efficiently into the future. But balance of payments, I don't, I don't need to, I don't make any expectations about the balance of payments in order to act efficiently into the future. I just say, you know, it'd be better for me to work overtime, get a little bit more cash, because I, I've got this, you know, preference for, for uh, you, you know, uh, uh, making this uh, transaction. Uh, I, I have this anticipated use for the cash or whatever. I, I don't need to know anything about my balance. I don't need to say, oh, I need to increase my surplus with Grove City College. You know, that, that's just superfluous. I'm just, I'm just sort of keeping a ledger account when I do this. And there may be some reason for me to do this, but it, again, it's not essential for my decision making. I can dispense with it. <clears throat> uh, okay, so um, let's. Uh, I'll, I'll just throw up real quickly this example. We we'll spend too much time with this, but this is a nice uh, numeric example of what the balance of payments accounts would look like for one country in a in a year. Uh, now, notice they they have a merchandise. Uh, 
uh, deficit, right? They're importing more than they're exporting. This is the merchandise trade balance. This is what the protectionists tend to worry about. We'll see why in a minute. We'll see their argument in a minute. <clears throat> Uh, and services, they're also uh, running a deficit in services. They're importing more than they're exporting, right? So they're, uh, it, this is a debit item and a credit item. And then the current account would also include invest, investment income that, that, that comes from investments that one has made, foreign investments, and then the income comes. That's part of the current, what's called the current account. And unilateral receipts are gifts. So if I had a Chinese friend and this friend you know, just sent me a Christmas uh, bonus or something, you know, that would be a unilateral receipt. <clears throat> and then the capital account will always balance out the current account. Right? It has to, because these are the offsetting money flows to the goods flows that are in the current account. So here, their long-term borrowing, short-term borrowings, there's the movement of uh, money. And the same way we can lend, right, long-term, short-term, and then the movement of money. And so everything, the, the sum of these always has to balance for every, for uh, any two trading partners or any two groups of people that are trading between themselves, you know, let alone any particular uh, group of people and everybody else in the world. They're just, again, uh, ledger accounts. Now, what they do, uh, the one thing that uh, ba these balance of payments accounts do tell us that we might not know uh, otherwise is, is the kind of pattern of people's preferences. We sort of see in the aggregate what people's preferences are. We can see in this example, for, uh, to take this case, that the foreigner, whoever this is against, the foreign uh, the trading partners, uh, value the goods produced by these people more highly than these people value the goods produced by the foreigners. That's why they export uh, uh, you know, less than they import, right? And, and, and the same thing about the capital account. The, these people have higher time preferences, right? Because the foreigners are lending to them. Okay, so we can see that in the balance of payment. We could see that, by the way, with other statistics. We don't need balance of payments to know this. We could just look directly at lending and borrowing or directly at uh, you know, purchases of uh, goods and so on. But, but uh, okay, so the balance of payments are useful uh, in that limited sense. <clears throat> uh, okay. Now let's go on to the, uh, to the argument about the merchandise trade imbalance that protectionists offer. And this is that the protectionism can uh, boost domestic employment. And it works again by subsidizing exports. So if the, if the government subsidizes exports, uh, then uh, it'll stimulate production of the exports and we'll sell more to the foreigners. And then we can tax the imports and that, that also has the benefit of stimulating domestic production because now domestic consumers will have to turn to domestic producers. So we tax the import, you know, we tax the uh, importation uh, of Japanese automobiles and that would provide employment in Detroit. That's the idea. And notice again, we're running a big budget surplus. When we do this, we're, we're increasing the budget surplus, the, the merchandise trade imbalance. And the argument here is not, we, we, it's not the, the, uh, the mercantilist argument that we want money flowing in. The argument here is this helps employment. Right? So it's a different goal that the protectionist has in this, uh, in this line of argument. Okay, so what, do, what does uh, economics say about this? Again, the classical economists were up to the task of debunking uh, this claim. Uh, Adam Smith in his Law of Absolute Advantage pointed out that you know, if we do this, if we, if we, uh, if we have a, a free trade, then uh, the division of labor will uh, arrange an efficient use of all the different workers. And so any interference of the state in this would mean that we, we, we're replacing a, an, a, an efficient foreign producer with an inefficient domestic producer. And this is not socially beneficial, right? So, so, so Adam Smith was up to the task of showing the basic error here. <clears throat> uh, Ricardo went one step beyond, remember, in the idea of comparative advantage. He said, uh, he said uh, this would, would always be the case for any two countries trading. It would always be the case, in other words, that one is efficient in one thing, that they're selling to the other country, and then the, the first country is more efficient in something else, and that's why they're selling it to the, to the uh, second country. And therefore, it couldn't be the case, in other words, that one country is more efficient in everything. 
and therefore it would be a good thing to you know uh, keep out the inefficient producers from foreign lands. He said he can't. That can't be the case. One must be efficient in one thing, and the, the other efficient in something else. And if they're already engaged in a free voluntary trade of these goods, then that's evidence of who's efficient in what. And so if we interfere with this, again, we're, uh, all we're really doing is replacing eff efficient producers with inefficient ones. Yeah, we're replacing efficient foreign producers with inefficient domestic producers. We're sheltering uh, consumers from the efficiency of the Japanese auto manufacturers in order to subsidize the inefficient Detroit manufacturers. <clears throat> Uh, and then fi finally, uh, Mises comes in with the law of association uh, also on this point, saying that <clears throat> in a market economy, everyone can be employed. It's just a matter of the wage, right? The, the less productive will have to accept lower wages, but they can be employed. They, be precisely because they're willing to accept lower wages, they can outcompete other people who are more productive, who command higher wages to do the same job. And therefore, protectionism doesn't change the total amount of employment. It can't. All it does is shift employment again from uh, efficient to inefficient producers. Just the opposite of what the market is doing. Shifting market is always shifting employment from inefficient to efficient. Right? So, so again, there's no, there's no social justification for this. It's obviously just uh, special interests at work. Uh, okay, so now let's go on to uh, the infant industry argument. Uh, this was famously uh, offered by uh, Alexander Hamilton. You can boo and hiss if you'd like at this point. <laughs> but uh, here the argument is that uh, uh, there could be, uh, you know, comparative advantage is all well and good. This is great and so on and so forth. But there might, it might just be the case that there's a kind of dynamic uh, that the market wouldn't account for. There might be an uh, industry that's just getting started. Uh, in the U.S., and uh, maybe if it had a little bit of help, subsidized help, it could grow into a comparative advantage, right? But if, we're, if we don't give it this artificial help, the the foreign, the evil foreign competitor, you know, will kind of strangle it in its, in the crib. That, that's the you know the infant industry, right? That's kind of the uh, polemic uh, picture that uh, Hamilton's trying to paint. <clears throat> um, Okay, well, the economist's response to this, of course, is first of all, that only entrepreneurs are in a position to ascertain the future with respect to different production processes. They're, they're the best at determining which industries uh, will, in fact, uh, develop and which won't. So the infant industry argument, remember, re requires, it, it, it assumes, that after a period of um, nurturing the infant through subsidies, that the infant will in fact grow into a mature adult industry. Well, how, does the gov how do government officials know this? How, why, do, why would we think that they're good at predicting this, right? So, so since the argument relies on anticipate, anticipating the future, the pro one proper response by economists is, well, that's the job of the entrepreneur. A, that's what entrepreneurs do. Now, on this other point, some retort to this uh, argument by saying, well, well, that's all well and good, but, but part of the problem is, or the remaining problem is, that uh, the, uh, the entrepreneurs will be too uh, reticent to uh, funnel capital funding. They, they won't capitalize the infant uh, but just because it's too risky or whatever it is. And so the government not, doesn't have to be concerned about risk, right? They don't have to be concerned about earning return on their investment so they can just tax us and provide the capital funding. So, there, so the, there's a problem of capital funding. Right? The, the argument shifts to capital funding. <clears throat> but here, again, uh, just standard economics has the answer to this. It's, it's just not true that capital funding is inadequate in the market. Uh, the capital markets are enormous. Um, the latest figure that I, I could find... Uh, for the size of world capital markets comes from 2011, so it's a little bit dated. But the total size of all, all financial markets, all capital markets, bond markets, stock markets, and so on, $212 trillion in 2011. Now, you know, the whole US economy is only $17 trillion. So, so you could easily, right, 10 times over, you can fund the entire US economy from the world capital markets. 
Of course, you could fund some industry then, right? And that's just so it's just a silly, uh, silly example that uh, or a, a argument that people give uh, because they they rely on our ignorance about the size of world capital markets. It's just a question of whether your idea for the investable project is appealing to the capitalists or not, right? Whether you can persuade them to back you or not. There's plenty of funding. So we, again, this is not a barrier. It, that's the job of the capitalists and the entrepreneurs to allocate this funding. So if you have a good idea for you know, a startup, then you can get the funding. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, this argument was a lot harder to make for, for people to accept, say 10 or 20 years ago. But today, you guys, Right, you have no problem with this, right? Crowdfunding and all this. Stuff. You know, we're so as as we as society becomes wealthier and wealthier, these arguments for protectionism become less and less persuasive, right? It's just uh, really, you know, we can't get funding. That just seems like uh, you're living in a different world. What, what, you know, hope you know most people, most young people, you recognize right away that no, no, that's not that's really not a problem. Uh, and we can we can point to numerous examples of of you know, infant industries who obtained funding. One of my thing, favorite examples is Honda. So the Honda uh, company started as a little uh, motorcycle company, uh, you know, in the 1950s, after the war. And uh, they, uh, the uh, Japanese economy was, of course, heavily cartelized, right? So the Japanese didn't favor Honda as an auto producer. They favored Toyota and, you know, connected the uh, cart cartelized industry. And Honda fought all that and, and became, you know, the, the company they are today, right? A very prominent uh, auto company. They, they, they got the funding, uh, even though the government was against them doing this. So it's certainly possible for other companies to do that. You may remember that Apple Inc. was just, was a dying company until Steve Jobs came back the second time, right? They got plenty of funding. <laughs> just a matter of, do you have good ideas that, that people will fund? Okay, so that's not, again, too, uh, too difficult. Well, how about the level playing field? Uh, this argument is often uh, brought up. Uh, the protection uh, uh, can level the playing field, and that's what we need, uh, you know, in order to provide uh, good, uh, good uh, economic outcomes. And despite what the Donald says, uh, you know, the economy is not a game. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not a game show or a game where uh, you know one one person is uh, you know negotiating and then better than another person. Uh, you know, I'm not saying there's no negotiating in economic life, but the economy itself is not a game. Right? It's social cooperation. It's not a game. And, and so it has no, none of the characteristics of a game in that, in that respect. Right? We're not playing a game. We're not out-competing. You know, it's not that uh, Donald Trump can, can uh, be a better negotiator against the uh, Germans or whatever and get the better deals or the Chinese or whatever he's saying. Right? Uh, that's not really the nature of, uh, of the economy. Uh, and so we don't really have to worry about the, I mean, the, the whole notion of a level playing field in playing a game sort of dissolves. It's just not applicable uh, to, uh, to uh, economic activity uh, itself. <clears throat> um, and then, again, we would point out this other, uh, this other uh, uh, main point that we made before, that even if, even if one you know, dispenses with the game metaphor and just says, well, but they're still engaged in helping their own industries, then we're just back to the original argument we talked about before. Yeah, it's true that if, if other governments engage in protectionism to help their domestic industries and they injure then uh, people in both uh, uh, political territories, it's not a good policy to follow that up by injuring our people even more by setting up additional protectionist policies, right? That, that just doesn't even make sense. The, the, the whole argument uh, uh, rests upon the claim that the protectionist uh, policies are uh, helping us domestically. <laughs> but, you know, they, okay, so if they're not, then this argument again sort of washes away. <clears throat> uh, by the way, let me also deal with the ancillary point. I don't have it on the slide, but... Uh, some people say kind of the uh, ultimate uh, expression of this unfairness in trade, uh, you know, pl not playing the game fairly, is dumping. So what happens if foreigners dump products on our economy? Isn't that bad? Shouldn't we be wary of this, right? Uh, you know, so if the Japanese just gave us their cars for $1,000 or something, then, you know, shouldn't that concern us? Wouldn't we want to, you know, stop that or... <clears throat> 
And aside from the obvious point that, uh, at least in the short run, this would be a good thing right, for, our, for our consumers, the, the more general point really is this one, that it's really the job, once again, of entrepreneurs to anticipate exactly what the future configuration of production and consumption will look like in any market situation, in any situation whatsoever, no matter how the states are interfering with it. So in other words, it would be entrepreneurs producing automobiles in the U.S. who would say, hmm, you know, here we've got these competitors and they're, they're, they're dumping these products. And I think they're just going to do this temporarily and then they're going to raise their prices, you know, if we all go out of the industry, you know, in the later. It's up to the entrepreneurs to, to decide that. And then they would say, okay, if I think they're going to do this in five years, I'm just going to hold on to my factory. I'll just mothball it. And, and when they stop dumping, I'll, I'll be in a position then to take the market. That, we, we don't need the state, right, to, to, to sort of counteract a pernicious dumping. This is just one other entrepreneurial problem that the entrepreneurs solve. This happens all the time in markets, right? People are competing in various ways and the entrepreneurs are adjusting. It's, it, it's no big deal. It's, uh, it's not theoretically different uh, than the regular problem of entrepreneurship. Okay, how about insulation from booms and busts? What about that? Uh, you know, again, if we have a world where other countries are, have uh, monetary inflation and credit expansion, then don't we need protectionism, capital controls and so on to keep that from spreading to our country? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a justification for protection? But here again, uh, we can see uh, hopefully fairly uh, readily that uh, if we had a complete market economy in one country, we had a gold standard or some commodity money and 100% reserve banking, then that country would be, in fact, uh, insulated from uh, fiat inflation of other countries. What would happen, of course, is the economic calculation within this country that has hard money would be unimpaired. They would just continue to engage in economic calculation with the sound money. And the foreign money would, would devalue. So, so it isn't obvious that there would be any transmission of this, uh, of this boom process uh, to the sound money country. There'd be no lowering of the interest rate or credit expansion. You could have 100% reserve banking. Right? So, you know, there could, I'm not saying that there would be no interconnectedness that might lead to certain malinvestments, but there's no systematic boom bus process. Again, it's an entrepreneurial question as to whether or not, let's say we had a mining operation in the sound money country and mining prices, you know, commodity prices go way up because of the boom and the bust and the adjustment isn't fully accounted for in the movement of exchange rates. But presumably it would be, but let's just assume for the sake of argument, it's not. And so the, the commodity price is elevated above the cost of production then again, it's just an entrepreneurial uh, question as to whether or not the entrepreneurs who are mining in the sound money country expand, oh, you know, over expand or not. It's just, it's just a, it reduces down to the same old entrepreneurial question because the interest rates are not being affected in the, in the sound money country. They're not involved in a boom and a bust. They're just involved in judging whether or not this, this temporary increase in the price of the commodity is sustainable. And, and that they can do. They're not being sort of misled into the malinvestment process. <clears throat> um, uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, the argument about uh, booms and busts. Uh, how about national security? Don't we need uh, uh, protectionism to uh, keep us safe uh, in, you know, to make sure we have uh, trading partners, uh, reliable trading partners? Uh, to keep us safe from, um, you know, again, a country, say Japan, would uh, sell to us um, uh, certain components for um, uh, military use. And uh, then they, they would be, it would be this sneaky policy that they have of getting us to depend upon them. And then they would cut us off. And the next day they declare war and we'd be caught short, right, with no, no means of, you know, repairing our equipment or whatever because we become dependent upon them. Well, again, the standard uh, response to this, so the first bullet point, of course, standard res response to this is free trade means that we have open trade with all trading partners, right? So we can find another trading partner. That, that's the advantage of free trade. We don't, we don't become completely dependent on one supplier. It, we, we, could, uh, we could have a supplier in Norway or a supplier in, you know, wherever, um, uh, China, who would uh, sell us the same or a, a compatible product. 
<clears throat> but beyond that, again, this is an entrepreneurial question, it seems to me. Mm-hmm. In other words, in, in, a, in a perfectly free economy, if entrepreneurs judge, they're the ones who have to judge whether or not they become too dependent on one particular supplier. They do this all the time. It's just a normal business activity of theirs, right? So it wouldn't be any different if, they, if, if this was a war, you know, a potential war situation. It would be exactly the same. Uh, conceptually, it's exactly the same, right? They would just have to say, do I think that this producer is reliable or unreliable? Should I produce this good myself? You know, what would the cost structure be like? Should I find another trading partner in another country to sell me this good? And so on and so forth. So again, this doesn't seem to present any particular problem. Uh, by the way, the, the, this last point, uh, I just want to make as a kind of uh, ancillary. You know, if the, if the government were really, really, really concerned about national security, do you think they would waste all of the money that, and, and resources that they waste on national defense? I mean, if the, if, if the Huns were really at the door, do you think that they would you know, have all these boondoggle uh, projects? You probably read about the F-35 fighter jet that doesn't fight, you know, they can't, it doesn't fly right or whatever. <laughs> it's, it's the most expensive weapon system ever in history. You, you think they would do this if the, like the, you know, the Soviet hordes were pouring down from Canada upon us? No. <laughs> This is just a gigantic scam, right? Of course, they're not interested in national defense. I mean, sort of vaguely interested in national defense, but they're they're really interested in pork because that's what they're producing is pork. Right? So, so yeah, really, we should be concerned about this, about the free market not providing us with this. Uh, okay, well, uh, let's do uh, this. This uh, are, well, I'm sort of running out of time. Let me skip this one and go to a, the one that's more common. This one is the idea that free trade, you know, makes some people better off, but not everybody. Free trade wouldn't leave everybody better off. That would be uh, the claim, you know. Uh, let's say if we have a configuration of protection and we remove the barriers, then some people would wind up with lower incomes and so on. But remember, laissez-faire means that each person benefits to the extent that they benefit others. Right? That's what the principle is. We, we earn income to the extent that we serve others' uh, satisfactions. That's the principle behind it. And over time, of course, laissez-faire does raise the, standard, the material standards of living of everyone. And again, think of this in comparison to the state. Protectionism also harms some people and benefits others, right? So, so, it's not, so, so, so why is that better? You see the logical problem? And then in the long run, of course, Protectionism actually injures everyone's standard of living in the long run. If it's extended far enough, right, it, it would suppress our standards of living in the long run all around. And so it, that doesn't seem like a better option than, than laissez-faire. <laughs> and then finally, let me uh, end with uh, this uh, one. Uh, you hear this sometimes, right, that uh, the, the uh, free trade or the free market would not uh, obtain for us our non-material goals. But once again, we have to do a comparative analysis, don't we? If we have non-material goals to attain, let's say, for example, we, uh, 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 we have a group of Christians and they want to evangelize people. So they have this like a spiritual goal or they want to give charity to the poor or whatever it is. Can't we just uh, 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 organize in voluntary associations to provide these non-material goals? Do we really need the state to coerce us in order to provide this non-material goal? Again, it doesn't seem like that's a, a, a very correct general principle. Uh, it seems that, again, if the state coerces us to provide non-material goals, what they're really doing is just forcing certain people who don't agree with those goals to fund them, which, which doesn't happen in, in the free society. Here, we, we fund these uh, voluntary associations uh, voluntarily. So, so, again, it doesn't seem like the state's uh, um, intervention here is very justifiable. All right, at this point, I'll, uh, I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you.